to my first guest, um, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Susie Ember. We're going to be talking about being an astronaut. We're going to talk about uh, life on Venus. We're going to talk about uh, Mercury's magnetosphere. We're going to talk about bacon sandwiches. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Susie Ember. <laughs> I should say, how do we get the screen so we can, so I don't have this massive holding slide of me and uh, I can't I see know. myself doing yeah. anything. Sam, how do we do, do we do a thing where we can, because I can't see me or Susie, I've just got a big holding slide of my face, which is really, <laughs> change your own views. So how do I do that? Yeah, let me do it, you just keep talking. Um, so this is, uh, <laughs> I should say as well, thank you very much. Uh, oh, there we go, that's much better. I didn't know how to see. What you need is a, you need a space physicist to, to figure out the Zoom chat. Um, not only have I got Susie in, but on the sofa, I'm actually in Susie's house. <laughs> this is true. So I, I, <laughs> I've, I've, been, house. I've been kind of pretending that this is my house, but it's not. I, I've actually come up to Susie's house. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, and it's a very nice house. Thanks. I particularly like your cow cushion. It, 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 it's very good. Now, we've got so much to talk about, but, but before we do anything, there's a picture. Sam, actually, can we have our sort of first slide? I wanted to call this talk the grand adventure because I think... I mean, you've obviously had lots of adventures. We're going to talk, talk about your adventures in a moment. But I just think space generally, it's a big adventure. Whichever angle you take on it, whether you're a scientist or an, or a, uh, you know, a, a, an astronaut, whatever you are, it's just exciting, isn't it? Yeah, surely. Everyone's inspired by looking up at the sky or maybe thinking about going to space one day. Who doesn't want to go to space? So I'd be the worst astronaut in the world, as we're probably going to find out. True, actually, actually <laughs> Sam, my next slide, in fact, this next slide, this picture here. Now, this, out of all the pictures ever taken. I, and I wanted to put this slide up, particularly because um, Kathy Sullivan, who I'm going to talk to later on, the, the NASA astronaut we're going to meet, she is actually responsible for this picture. Mm. One of the people responsible for this picture. Yeah. So this is a, a, a picture of the night sky, a region of the night sky taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, which is a telescope that is in orbit around the Earth. And it's in orbit because obviously the atmosphere, the Earth's atmosphere, distorts the light, which makes... Uh, astronomy on Earth a little bit blurry using telescopes. But up in space, we get this wonderful clear view. And each one of those points of light, I mean, the, some of them are stars, that big sort of bright blob of yellow in the middle is a star. But most of those points of light aren't stars at all, they're galaxies. Those are galaxies. Millions of stars, yeah. How many stars do we have in a galaxy? Millions. Loads. Millions, <laughs> I don't know, millions. But it's the most extraordinary image. Yeah. I mean, when I first saw that about 20 years ago, my mind was absolutely blown that there is so much stuff out there. And that's just a small portion of the night sky. You know, that's just a tiny section of the sky as you look upwards, and this extends you know, all around. Yeah, I, I think, I, for me, that's probably the most important photograph in all of astronomy, yeah, yeah. because it just shows how utterly tiny and insignificant we are. And Kathy allowed this to happen because her mission was associated with the launch of the space telescope. She did. Can you, okay, we can go back to the other, the, the other slide now. Uh, I'm looking so. forward to you chatting to her about yeah, I want to know how I want to know how stressful it would be. Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, it's like it's no like, pressure, it's like a, but <laughs> I don't know how much the, the telescope costs. Like billions, billions and billions yeah. of uh, billions. Dude, of, yeah, don't get it wrong. Yeah, yeah. Don't muck it up. This is what this is in terms of being an astronaut. Um, hang on, someone's talking. How many types of stars are there in the galaxy? Oh, these are big questions yeah, coming. Yeah, there's a lot of questions. big questions coming. Hang through. on, uh, we got. I'm just going to do before we go into space news. I've got some questions. How does a black hole form? Should we do that? Well, we could do. Or we, or that could be a good question for the astronomer that you're going to talk to a little bit later. We'll wait. We'll hang on to the, we'll hang <laughs> on to the back. I just want to do a little bit of space news um, because the last month's been really, really interesting for space news, particularly this. I'm pressing the change slide button. Sam. <laughs> yes. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to, when I do that, that means <laughs> press the button. Is there life floating in the clouds of Venus? This came out a couple of weeks ago, about a month ago. Yeah. One of, I think, probably the greatest question in all of space science is the search for life out there. Um, apparently there's life on Earth, although I'm yet <laughs> to be convinced sometimes when I watch the news. Um, but apparently there's life floating in the clouds well, of Venus. Well, I think, you know, it's a bold statement, actually. So, so um, I know this was the headline, is there life floating in the clouds of Venus? And everyone got really excited and sort of imagined little green men living in clouds. But yes, actually, exactly <laughs> that I wasn't imagine. what was measured. Um, some scientists measured something called phosphine, pH3. Uh, and that's like a biomarker. So on the Earth, uh, phosphine is produced by life. Um, and in some other planets, it's produced in different ways. And finding it on Venus in the clouds is interesting because Venus is a super tough environment. So um, the surface of Venus is many hundreds of degrees. Celsius, it's super hot. 
um, really high pressure, just not an environment where you're going to find life. And then if you go up away from the surface into the clouds, you reach a point where actually the temperature is kind of like the temperature on earth. The pressure is kind of like the pressure on earth. And you think, well, maybe there could be life there. And that's where they found this phosphine. They seem to be pretty, I mean, you know, we get excited when we hear stories like this, but listening to the science talking, they were obviously being quite cautious because scientists are very cautious about, <laughs> you know, what they, what they release. Uh, I did feel they were like, yeah, it's definitely like, no, I know they definitely right. didn't say that, but I think secretly deep down in their well, water. Everybody wants that to be the exactly. answer. But, uh... Uh, have, but uh, just on that subject, have, this is a picture this is a picture from uh, a few years ago. Yeah. Now this, okay. I remember about, gosh, it must be about 30 years ago. This picture you can see of this kind of strange worm-like creature. Now, this was actually from a Martian meteorite, the Allen Hills meteorite that was found in Antarctica. Uh, and it sat on a shelf for years and years and years. And then a couple of scientists were bored one day. And they're like, oh, I wonder what that's on the shelf. And they looked at it through the microscope and they saw this shape. And they got very excited because they thought, oh, my goodness, we found a fossilized worm that's originated from Mars. And everyone got very excited. And I remember Bill Clinton, who was the American president at the time, uh, did a whole press statement on the, on, the, on the White House lawn. Ladies and gentlemen, we found life on Mars. And they all got very excited. And it turned out it wasn't a worm. It was just, you know, it was a, it was a bit of something that looked a bit yeah, like a worm. Yeah, and now you wonder why scientists are cautious when they make big announcements in the press. <laughs> and this is, this is why I've got this little quotation. Can you read, read this? Read that. When we have strong emotions, we are liable to fool ourselves. In the Carl Sagan voice. No, I can't do the Carl Sagan voice. You when know. we have strong emotions, uh, we are liable to fool ourselves. <laughs> Carl Sagan was my favorite astronomer, American astronomer. He was, he was brilliant. But his point is really, really valid, I think. It's when we get excited about things like life on other planets, we go, yeah, life, we found worms on, on Mars. Uh, the job of the scientist is to just put a, just to go, whoa, mm, just slow it down. <laughs> so uh, there you go. Not to call scientists killjoys, but it's but it's but it's useful anyway. So there you go. So that's ex ex still exciting news. There's another piece of space news actually. We do. Let's have some more space news. What, what's my next bit of space news? Well, well, I think the other piece that we didn't have, we didn't put up actually, is that um, there is a, a meteorite shower that's happening at the moment. So um, last night and tonight are going to be brilliant nights if you're outside and you have clear sky. Okay. Look up. There should be um, at least five roughly shooting stars an hour for you to go and have a look. It's at. not the Persian no, meteor shower. Draconids. I knew that. So, uh, Which, what's it called? Good. The Draconids. I think. The Draconids meteor shower. So, if you've got a clear night wherever you are tonight, go, go and lie on your back in a damp field and look at the <laughs> look at the. Um, this was this slide. This has nothing to do with meteor showers. This is the Perseverance rover, which is currently en route to Mars. Mm -hmm. Although I'm feeling a little bit. I feel a bit sorry for them because they've been slightly overshadowed by the Venus news. <laughs> yes. They're like, no, oh, we wanted to find life first. Um, so this is going to be landing in February next year. So it's en route to Mars. And it's the latest generation of the Mars rover. So at the moment, we've got the Curiosity rover, which looks very similar to this. But there's some great experiments on this particular rover that's never been used on a Martian rover before, particularly where it says MOXIE down at the bottom. They're actually going to produce oxygen. And this is a test experiment. They're actually going to produce oxygen from the, from the carbon dioxide Martian environment testing whether we can do that on, on a big scale so when you go to mars <laughs> when in I a couple of years time uh, you'll be able to breathe <laughs> but also and i don't have a picture of it they've got a helicopter mm. it's got to be the coolest helicopter job ever actually helicopter pilot for the helicopter on mars how cool what is a that great job. so this is what i mean like you know if, you, if you're interested in in a space career you could be a martian helicopter designer pilot type person <laughs> which i think is very cool so keep an eye on that it's perseverance rover uh, worth a google you can have a look at all the kind of nasa stuff and it tells you uh, how it all works and what's going on uh, but they're going to be doing some fantastic science uh, so that's mars news what's the next news sam what else do i have up there uh yes this is i think this is really exciting news uh this is the first crewed spacex dragon uh, crew that's going up to the International Space Station. Uh, when is it going up? It's going up on Halloween this year, mm. in, in a couple of weeks' time. I don't know if you remember, a couple of months ago, two or three months ago, they, uh, SpaceX sent a capsule up to the International Space Station with two astronauts, uh, Bob Benkin and Doug Hurley, as, as a test mission. And that was the very first time that astronauts had left uh, Earth from American soil going up to the space station, because normally astronauts for the last, gosh, since 2011, 
have used the Soyuz rocket. So this is a whole new space capsule. And you can get up to, I think, up to seven people in the Dragon capsule. So this is a group of four going up because Soyuz is only three. So suddenly space is opening up again. Different people from different backgrounds are going to be going up to space. So keep an eye on that. That is the SpaceX uh, launch from Pad 39A at the Kennedy Space Center on Halloween this year. So if you're not out trick-or-treating, I'm going to be watching that. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm be good. <laughs> Hang on, I've got a meet your question. Question, how does meet your showers occur from Northburn Primary School, Cramlington? Yes, Cramlington, near from where I used to live. Uh, what's a meet your shower? How does just, it work? It's just rocks, rocks entering the Earth's atmosphere and burning up. Let's have us back again. Right how do we, yeah, how do we do, Sam, do the double thing where we're like side by side. How does that work? Um, yeah, let's do that. Uh, so they're just rocks that, that burn up in the Earth's atmosphere, and as they burn up, they're super bright, and we see them as shooting stars, but they're lumps of rock from space, basically. And there are times in the Earth's orbit where they encounter lots of these rocks in a particular place as we orbit around the sun. Uh, and that's why we see meteor showers, because suddenly we go through a patch of these rocks, and you get loads of them coming into the atmosphere and burning up. Sometimes they make it all the way to the ground, actually. Sometimes they, they don't do. burn up in space. Sometimes they land on the ground. And if you find one... With a worm in it. With a worm in it, that's really exciting. Without a worm in it, they're still pretty exciting. They, they, um, we have actually expeditions that go to places like Antarctica and the desert hunting for these rocks that make it to the ground because you can use the rocks to tell us something about the environment and the planet they came from. I heard something the other day which I hadn't even occurred to me about that, which I think is really interesting. And you'll never, ever forget this because I'm going to tell you. Why is it that people hunt for meteorites and, and such things in deserts? Like you kind of think, well, why would they specifically land in deserts or particularly Antarctica? <laughs> yes. And the answer is really the answer simple, is but the, I, I'm thick. I didn't get it. They don't just target uh, the, the <laughs> desert to land in or Antarctica to land in. They land all over the Earth's surface. But if one lands in your back garden, you might not notice. Um, whereas if you go to Antarctica or the desert, yeah, you've got this vast expanse of either sand or ice and they show up because they're often black lumps on a, on a white background. And so they're much easier to find. So maybe if anyone's interested, uh, you actually can sign up to join the meteor hunters. Uh, yes. And you can go to Antarctica for a season hunting for these rocks. And that's something that I particularly want to do. I also want to um, do this. I've got like a- We should sign up, we should sign up. I, I, we're not gonna have time to do our show because I've got too many questions. Uh, <laughs> how heavy is a spacesuit? That's uh, from ooh, Durham Federation. You know that. I, well, it's a really good question. It depends which space that you're talking about. That one behind me uh, is just a mock-up. Don't tell anyone. Uh, so it doesn't really weigh anything at all. Um, <laughs> but the kind of big EVA suits that they use um, on the International Space Station don't weigh anything at all because they are in microgravity free-falling around the Earth. So they are completely weightless like everything else. Or it's a bit like floating in the ocean, you know, if you're floating in yes, the ocean. Yes, neutrally suit, buoyant. You don't feel... Yeah, exactly. So, so it doesn't, but actually when they were using these particular suits to walk on the moon 50 years ago, of course the moon has one sixth gravity. So they do weigh stuff. So on earth, they would have been incredibly heavy. As, that you, as you walk, yeah. But, uh, but on yeah. the moon, it's suddenly, it's, it's much lighter, but it still has, it still has weight. Uh, too many questions. <laughs> stop with the questions. <laughs> no, don't stop. Uh, don't stop. Asking. Okay. Someone's <laughs> asked me this question. Uh, uh, Mrs. Hodgson, very quickly, one word answer, two word answer. How many types of stars in, in galaxies? galaxies? Oh, that's, well, that's not a two word answer. It actually kind of depends on how you classify stars. Uh, Aren't we a main sequence Well, there are, there are main sequence stars, but there's, you know, different types of, there's lots of different types of star. That's a tricky question that we can't answer in two seconds. Sorry. Mrs. Hudson, I'm sorry. Forgive us. Maybe, maybe this on. afternoon, I'll see astronomer. All then right. Have a bit more we'll, time. We'll, we'll figure it out. Uh, oh, this is a good, okay, someone, I don't know who's answered this question, but, but, and then we'll move on. What type of fuel do spaceships use? Because this is going to nicely segue onto well, our next question. It depends question. on what you're trying to do, or where you're trying to get to, right? I mean, it's a re actually, I'll tell you what, we can talk to Cathy Sullivan about this, because Cathy's first shuttle mission, I believe, the main science she had to do was test out a device that could refuel satellites uh, and satellites are fueled by things called hydrazine, which is a very, very toxic, highly explosive uh, substance. Uh, and th she had to figure out how to kind of refuel from space with like a petrol pump. Yeah, I struggled with my car. So. Exactly. So we can talk to her, but it depends. Yes, uh, hydrogen, uh, so if trying to, if you're solid rocket initial, boosters. Initial yeah, lift, or if you're lift. actually in space already and you're just trying to change Correct. the direction you're going in, you might use something different. Well, we'll talk a bit about that later, actually. Not later, right now, oh. Sam, because hit the button. We're going to talk about rocket science. Okay, nice. <laughs> Next slide, please, Sam. 
that is how to get to the moon. <laughs> this, I was thinking about this. I, 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 I love thinking about rockets and how we got into space. And um, one of my favorite writers ever, William Blake, who was a great poet a long, long time ago in the uh, 1700s, he did this, this little kind of lino etching uh, uh, of I want, I want this boy climbing a ladder to the moon. Of course, this is the 1700s. So no one had been into space or even kind of considered how we got into space. But that desire to go into space, that, that sense of, oh, I want to go to the moon and explore was still there. So we've got this lovely, lovely picture of I guess this young person climbing a ladder with his parents looking slightly concerned. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I wonder what they're saying. Like, don't do this, please. How that ladder's not safe. Um, I want, I want. I think nothing sums up uh, today the great adventure that is space better than that picture. I, I really, really like it. So what kind of fuel does spacecraft use? Not ladders. No, not ladders. No. And not this either. Next slide, Sam. Um, this is another one of my favorite rockets that never flew. Um, this is actually even earlier than the William Blake. This is from 16, rawr, 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 16 something. <laughs> uh, oh, hello, Pusscat. There's a pussycat down there. We might, this is Susie's cat. Oh, actually, it's not or Susie's neighbor's cat. Uh, space fact number one, very quickly. There was a cat actually went into space in 1961 on a, a French sounding rocket. I might come to that a bit later called Philisette. So anyway, cat. Hey, listen, I'm trying to do a live show. <laughs> listen, you can't sit there meowing. Now, this particular picture, again, long before rockets had been invented, this is the 1600s, an English bishop called Bishop Francis Godwin imagined, how do we go and explore the stars? How do we get there? How do we get to the moon? And he thought, actually, well, why don't we, you know, geese, he knew the geese migrated. And he imagined that there was a special kind of geese called Ganser that migrated between the earth to the moon. And so he figured out, well, if we could catch the geese and tie strings around their legs and have a little seat then it would pull us up up to the moon nice i think it's nice but it's certainly not very nice practical <laughs> not, not very practical uh which fast forwards us on to the the next little milestone of space history this is a what do you think of this jules verne this is beginning end of the 19th century jules verne very famous science fiction writer imagined a huge cannon mm. that would you, and you would sort of get inside a capsule and be fired at the moon. And be fired at the moon. Yeah, nice, like it. I don't know what happens when you land on the moon, when you hit the moon at speed, the other side, but yeah, nice. I think we need a bit of a trampoline to catch the person as they arrive on the moon. But... Yeah, I think the forces involved may be proved. <laughs> yeah. Think, how far be... is the moon? Quarter of a million very, miles. Very big cannon. 60,000 but... Earth radio. No, 60 Earth radio. But actually having, the, having a cannon, this is actually, it's quite a deep question. 36,000 kilometers away. It's amazing. <laughs> having it having a big can because that's like all your force at one go shooting yeah. you to the moon yeah whereas a rocket it's lots of chick, 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 mm. four, like spread out yeah so you'd a, get pretty squashed i think definitely get, yeah definitely squashed and also if you're going to the moon you need a big cannon on the moon to get you back again assuming you wanted to come home there is that hang on how long does that, i've got a question how long does it take to build a rocket i'm going to come to that in my next slide um actually go back go back a slide go back a slide i'm i'm, I'm yeah i'm gonna we're gonna talk about because we're getting lots of questions about rockets so i want to explore uh rockets so obviously no one had thought about rockets in terms of space travel at this point until the beginning of the 20th century actually well long actually let's go back a bit there was this guy called isaac newton tell me about isaac newton famous guy from a while back yeah who uh began thinking about uh, forces and how forces work and his famous uh um what's the word dictum law law that's the word. <laughs> yeah for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction yeah. um which means basically uh if you have something going one way so i i, I always demonstrate it with a balloon All so right, my balloon blow up my yeah. balloon so here we have a very kind of rather large weird balloon that i found in susie's house <laughs> i didn't want to ask <laughs> sorry <laughs> So we're going to explore how rockets work quickly. More I'm going to put more M's. <laughs> pausing to talk. <laughs> so fueling our rockets right now. So I'm fueling our rocket. So basically, Isaac Newton said, if you've got a balloon like this, if I let go of the balloon, all that gas is going to come bursting out because yeah. of the pressure of the balloon. And as the balloon gas comes out that way towards the ground, it should send the balloon up the other way. Should we try? Test. Or do I need more air? What? I mean, I'd say give right. it a bit more fuel. <laughs> might scare the cat. We though. might scare the cat. Okay, <laughs> well, we're going to try this. So basically, this is what Isaac Newton was talking about. 
kind of. Kind of that. <laughs> um, so all that gas comes out one way and sends a, a, a rocket up there. And so that was, when was Isaac Newton? When, when was that? Seven June, 16, 16, 15, 15, <laughs> long, time long time ago. Um, but that is essentially, that particular law is what gets us into space and what gets us exploring the cosmos. Another rocket experiment? I'm going to do a little rocket experiment for you. So that was my balloon rocket experiment. But just to make it, just to make it a little bit clearer, what I've got here, Susan, I'm going to need your help. Yeah. You can do this at home. Uh, this is how to build a rocket in your sitting room. Um, what you will need for this particular experiment is you will need a rocket, a body of a rocket. Now I'm using one of these. This is like a little film uh, canister. Uh, now film, you don't know what even will know what film is because you're all too young. Um, if you go into your parents' hall drawer, where the telephone is that they never use, uh, and open it, there'll be some old pens that don't work and some random batteries and things like that. Right at the back, there may be one of these. <laughs> Uh, long before we had digital cameras, we used to use film, and actually the film came in little pots like this, but they make great rockets. Uh, you can, and the, the other thing you can use is, you know you get those vitamin C tablets? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can use these those. Nice. Oh, we should... Mm. Yeah, they're really good. You know, they come in like a tube. They're, they're, they're bigger than that. Yeah, interesting. But I'm going to use one of these. Anyway, you can, you'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. And what you need then is some rocket fuel. So the rocket fuel that we're using for this particular rocket is some water. And I'm going to fill this... Uh, no, it's very, you've got to be very precise. That's a little bit too much. Just, I go to just under half. Yeah. 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 You've got to get it just right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Okay, so I've got just under half filled with water. Can you hold that up so everyone can see? Now, what I've got here is an Alka Seltzer. If mummy and daddy have gone out for a curry or they've had too much to eat or drink, then alka seltzers might be what they take. It's just, it settles the stomach. Oh, I guess some of those fizzy vitamin C tablets might work. The as fizz, your vitamin C <coughs> tube. Fizz, fizz, fizzy, that fizzes, basically. fizzy things. Tablets that fizz is what you need. Correct. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in the tablet that fizzes, my alka seltzer tablet. Uh, maybe not quite as much as. How how powerful do we want this to go? Whoa. I don't want to damage your ceiling. <laughs> What's going to happen is it's going to. I'm going to plop it in the water and it's going to fizz, pss, as you know. And that fizz, of course, is a gas that's being given off. That gas is carbon dioxide. Now, when I put the lid on the rocket, that gas is going to build up. It's going to build up until something breaks. And what's going to break is the seal, the seal of the lid onto the actual rocket itself. And if I turned it upside down, hopefully all the water and gas is going to push down onto the tray. And according to our friend oh, Isaac Newton, Newton, the rocket should go off in the, the equal and opposite reaction up. And hit my ceiling. And hit the ceiling. So, so we're going to try. So for all your, your questions about rocket science, this is kind of how it works. This is going to go really badly. <laughs> I, I know this is going to go really badly. Okay. Quick, it's it fizzing. It's fizzing. It's fizzing. I'm going to, Don't lose any. I'm going to shake it. Okay, let's do a countdown. Watch your head. Okay, so <laughs> 10, 9, 8, 8 7, 7, 6, 6 5. 5. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, there you go. Uh, where did it even go? And I have no idea where that went. Well. That, ladies and gentlemen. Boys and girls, <laughs> is how a rocket works. So all that gas and plastic lid went down the runway and the rocket went up the other. That's all a rocket is. A rocket is that. You've got to carry your own fuel. I was wondering how much Alka-Seltzer it would take to get to the moon. Like if you wanted to build a rocket. We should do the calculation. Probably more Someone, than there exists. If you're the bored earth. at school, go and do the calculation. Or um, the experiment. Now, I, a couple of years ago, actually five years ago, um, a gentleman called Tim Peake, who's a British astronaut, uh, lifted off on a Soyuz rocket from Kazakhstan to the International Space Station. And I was very lucky I got to go with Tim mm. for that launch. So that's the Soyuz rocket. I, the most famous rocket, of course, is this one, the Saturn V. This was the biggest rocket ever made. A lot of Alka-Seltzer to fuel <laughs> that one. That's the rocket that took, uh, uh, took us to the moon 50 years ago. Um, and this one, actually the next one, this is a very different kind of spacecraft as well. This is the Virgin Galactic space plane. I know you've done some work, a little bit of work with Virgin Galactic, haven't you? Yeah, I have, and it's a really different way of thinking about sending people to the edge of space. So basically, and um, this rocket is attached to a massive plane, like a massive aircraft, and the aircraft takes this rocket pretty high up, and then the rocket detaches, fires its rocket engines, uh, and it goes to a height of between 80 and 100 kilometers in altitude, so the edge of space, and you kind of fly in a big arc, and then you come back again if you're a passenger. This is what it looks like when you're a passenger. This picture is Beth Moses. 
<clears throat> that is when they're at the, sort of the apex of their flight that mm -hmm. are, and looking back down at the earth from 80 or 100 kilometers, whatever it is. And that's kind of <clears throat> the expression, I think, that all astronauts must have when they look back at the earth from space, that kind of, <gasps> oh my God, it's amazing. Um, I think astronauts, astronauts call it the overview effect. When, when, they, when they see the earth from space and they get that sense of scale and that sense of context. And I think, um, I love that picture of Beth looking Yeah, looking and we're going to see gasp. much more of this actually because uh, they're just starting uh, in the next year or two to send um, passengers into space on board. You can buy a ticket. Well, if you had lots of money, you could buy a ticket and head to the, head to the edge of space. I've already been down the back of your sofa. Have you? you found... Rooting around for coins to see. Uh, <laughs> yeah, sadly, nothing. Good luck with that. Not a thing. No. <laughs> uh, just an old... Uh, Think a couple of smarties. <laughs> anyway, um, this is a very good question. Actually, while we're while we're on the subject, Harry and Logan have asked a very good question. Okay. Do you smash a wine bottle off a rocket like you would a ship when you're launching? Ooh, it? You saw Tim Peake's launch. Yeah, smash any wine bottles? Well, kind of. They didn't smash a wine bottle, but you you saw that priest at the end blessing the rocket. So there's a lot of superstition that goes with launching people into space. Um, so, for example, the, the, the Russians have a priest, for example, but they also have there's a particular song that the astronauts have played when they when they leave their hotel. Uh, there's a tree that they plant. Every astronaut has to plant a tree in a particular garden. The American astronauts, before they launch, they always have to eat steak and eggs before they launch. You know, the humans are, we are superstitious. We are kind of interesting, bizarre creatures. I mean, obviously this stuff, it's not important from a scientific point of view, but it's comforting to hold on to these traditions and superstitions. And breaking a, a, a bottle across a, the bow of a ship on launch is exactly that. Uh, so there you go. Oh, this is a really good question. Who names rockets slash shuttles? Oliver St. Matthews. You, you, you must know this question. Where did these things get their names from? Yeah, no, good question. I think, they, I, th I think very often, like for example, the shuttle orbiters were all lo launched after famous ships of Discovery and Endeavour and you know, famous nautical ships from history. But things like the Martian rovers. Oh, well, there was a competition actually, wasn't there, to name correct. a Martian rover. So uh, there was a competition a couple of years ago, I think now actually. Yeah where you could put your suggestion forward for the next Mars rover and see if you get selected. And competitions are really, really good. Very often they happen. So for example, mission patches are very important. This is a, this is a, 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 a very old mission patch from one of the Gemini missions. But this one that looks a little bit familiar, the Principia uh, mission patch, this was Tim's patch. And this was designed as part of a Blue Peter competition. Mm -hmm. Blue Peter had a competition to get people to, to design it. And if you look at this particular patch, it's so symbolic of lots of different things. So we've got Isaac Newton here represented by this apple falling. We've talked about Newton. Principia, of course, with Newton's great mathematical work that he did. We've got a picture of the, the Soyuz. But what I like most about this particular patch is if you look at the reflection in the apple, that's actually a picture of the International Space Station. What? Did you not know that? No. Yeah. Ooh. Isn't that great? Yeah, nice. So a lot of thought. So, um, so th that's a little bit about naming things. What's it like looking back at the planet we live on? Uh, says Neve St. Cuthbert's crook. Well, look at Beth Moses's face. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I think it's basically <laughs> that. <laughs> I think it's pretty pretty amazing. Well, a lot of astronauts spend a lot of time taking photos of the Earth from space, don't they? And that's all they do. Time they have, they get a camera out and start taking photos of everything they can see. You can see weather systems above the planet's surface as well as the, the planet itself. So. I think it's time we talked a little bit about being an astronaut. Because, okay. uh, let's, right. uh, let's move on, Sam, if, if you can. So astronaut training. Um, you're not an astronaut. No. But you're kind of an astronaut. I mean, you know what it's, I think you know what it's like better than most people, what it takes to be an astronaut. I can't remember what my next slide is, Sam. So if you just kind of keep whizzing along. Ah, uh, so here we go. So this is, uh, this is your group of, of people. These are the people who, like, how did it work? Were you, did you have to get through preliminary stages mm, before you got yeah, to this lots point? Of, lots of rounds to get to here. So there was sort of an advert that went out. I, an email came to me actually at the university saying, does anyone want to be an astronaut? And so this sort of email came out and you could apply. And the first few rounds, you know, who are you? What, what do you do? What skills do you have? Why do you think you make a good astronaut, basically? So you have to kind of write, oh, my name's Susie. I think I make a good astronaut because. And then uh, if you get selected, you sort of keep going. And they were really looking for people that had the kind of skills that might enable them to be an astronaut. And traditionally that means scientists or doctors 
um, or pilots having that kind of um, technical background. So if you look at the 12 people, you can see I'm the one with the beanie on. That's my. That's how I always reckon because when the, I was watching the show. Yeah. It, Actually, having, having, yeah, having something like that, it's like I always knew it was you. Like all the others kind of, I slightly got a bit confused about who was who. But like Susie always had the beanie still on. still have so. that lucky hat, I love it. Where is it? Uh, it's, yeah, it's in the hall actually. Okay. Um, uh, I take it everywhere, honestly. Uh, you'll see that maybe later when, I, when we talk about Bethy Colombo. Um, so yeah, that's me with a hat on, but I actually had, they, they picked uh, 12 people in total to be part of the show. So it's a bit like the Bake Off, basically, where you sort of start with 12, you're trying to get to one. But everyone on the screen kind of has some skill that might, might be required to be an astronaut so were you not all like really jealous of each other when you all like turned up were you like wait a second <laughs> I, I, I want them to fail I, no I, no no you like good friends yeah or did you hate each other? no no we didn't hate each other at all. we were really good friends i mean in essence we're part of this show um 24 7 until we were kicked out and we didn't get to interact with the outside world we're really sort of enclosed in a bubble and so we became really good friends as the thing went through and although everybody i mean everyone wanted everyone else to do well bit like the Bake Off, you know, how you sort of think they're rooting for each other. Just like that, we all wanted each other to, to do well, actually. Um, and the nice part is that I can influence anyone else's um, test results. So I you know, couldn't make them do badly or well. So it was really lovely. And, um, and you haven't taken this off since. No, You're just, no, no, so she lit all the time. No, it's just <laughs> uh, but if you look at the people here, let's have a look at some of them. So on the far right hand side is Kerry. She's a pilot uh, in the Royal Air Force. Um, the guy in the middle, he was on the Great Britain bobsleigh team. He's also a scientist. Wow. Uh, second from the left, Hannah, she's climbed Mount Everest uh, and she's an elite runner and a dental surgeon from Ireland. Basically, the, kind of, the thing they all have, every, have in common, they're all like really good at something, a thing. Whether Some it... things, actually. So really good at their technical uh, skill, whatever that might be, scientist or pilot or doctor or surgeon, whatever it is. Right. Um, and then other things that they're also really good at that give them those sort of other skills. You know, so I'm a scientist. Um, sitting in a lab doing experiments or in front of a computer screen doing science physics theory is great and you get lots of skills in one area but if you want to send people into space you really want people that have really good social skills you know can be a leader and a communicator and a good team player and, mm. and so you learn that through other things that you do so for me rowing or lacrosse or mountaineering I'm really bad at things like zoom calls and like trying to <laughs> do the computers and stuff yeah I'm, good at, that, yeah I'm not sure you'd make the best out well we'll, we'll see i'm good at sandwich making <laughs> I, I can make good sandwiches someone had a good question um mrs carney so i need my glasses mrs carney hi mrs carney you oh i think mrs carney is a bit stressed because she wants to know how many children could fit on the she's ISS. trying to fit her entire yeah, class like, the ISS. send them, them all. all send them all quite a few yeah i, think. I mean Depends could, if, could fit or could live happily does she hasn't specified things. i think fit i, I think, think your just entire like, class could definitely fit up there it's pretty big it's pretty big yeah. It is pretty big, the um, International Space Station. You could live comfortably, maybe not your entire class. Depends. Oh, I tell you what, one day, one day if we do this again, I'll tell you the story about the Mir space station. I've got, oh, I'd love to talk. Love to talk. <laughs> uh, oh, God, someone's asking a really difficult question. How difficult are the energy calculations for escape velocity and the right angle of trajectory pre launch, and to what degree of accuracy do they have to be? Brr, that's from Paul. Well, from I the mean, Durham the escape one. velocity, yeah, I mean, we know what escape velocity is, so that's not a super difficult calculation. Well, I don't know what it's, they don't know what I, I How fast you have to go to escape, to escape you. the Earth's gravity, that's, that's the calculation you have to do. And, uh, and the answer is, is, is not very difficult to come up with. 24,000 miles, well, seven kilometers an hour. <laughs> there you go. In terms of, um, I think. In, of the trajectory of the spacecraft, that's quite interesting because it, it, you know, it depends on um, your rockets, when your rockets are firing different, your rockets don't just have one engine that fire, the first phase might fire and then some rockets may fall away and then the next phase might fire. And so it depends, it's actually quite a complex calculation. So things get more complex when you have to actually work out the launch calculations, but um, Maybe you'll learn that if you go and do physics at university. Go do physics at university <laughs> or do sandwich making at university. We'll, we'll about to good. see your sandwich making well, skills on, later. We're going to see gonna that. Come to that. Uh, let's have a look at some of your, your adventures. If you get a chance to watch this program, it might be on iPlayer. You'll be able to find it. BBC Astronaut, do you have what it takes? So this is failure, you'd call this. You've yeah. had, you had to learn to fly a helicopter in like two minutes. So just I had tell to us. learn to hover a helicopter. So what we're trying to do is hover this helicopter. It's quite close to the ground, actually. There's a real astronaut, Chris Hadfield, in the middle there. He's kind of judging us. Um, and we were asked to get into the helicopter and do that, hover it. Only we'd never been in a helicopter before, most of us. And so this, this is some of our attempts. And you can see, mm, that's not looking great. Um, the first person actually we're going to focus on is Prash. My really good friend Prash, he's lovely. He's a surgeon from Birmingham. This is Prash's first attempt at a hover. Um, 
Yeah, not great, kind of heading for vertical, going backwards. And we get, we have a real pilot next to us, making sure we don't crash the helicopter. It looks like you, they, I mean, it was a bit hairy. I was it's just... incredibly difficult. Yeah. Um, this is Hannah, and my really good friend Hannah. Hannah puts a helicopter in reverse and just reverses off the screen backwards and she's gone. Um, so yeah, this is a really tough challenge actually. And just, there's three sets of controls you have to use simultaneously. They're very, very delicate controls. This is, oh, that very close to crashing. That was crashed again. So you can see that actually, as each of us took over the controls, we lost control of the helicopter repeatedly. Um, and some people were marginally better than others, but basically we were terrible. Um, and that's why I've called this slide failure. But actually, um, we realized well after this test was complete, that was the whole point. We were designed to fail this test because it's impossible to get into a helicopter. It's like walking up to a piano and playing grade eight piano piece. Nobody can do that. You have to learn and practice. And that was the whole point. It was about how you fail and what your response to failure is. And actually some of our group got quite frustrated, quite angry, just, you know, were really beating themselves up about not being able to do this challenge. And others just kept trying, you know, kept trying to improve. What am I doing wrong? How can I do it better? And that's the attitude that you want to foster. That was the point of this challenge. It's a really good, because you, it was a bit of a, a bit of a trick question. Really. Mm. It wasn't like, how well can you fly a helicopter? No. How well can you deal with not, not being, being able, able to fly, fly a helicopter? helicopter? But they didn't tell you the yeah. right question. Let's have the next one. Uh, okay, so this is the other. If you want to be an astronaut, ladies and gentlemen, you need to be Fit. Yeah. You Why do you need to be healthy. so fit? Well, for a start, you're heading off somewhere where if something goes wrong, you're not going to have a hospital to hand. So um, you want to send the healthiest people you can. Uh, the space environment's really tough on the body. You know, it's really brutal um, on, on lots of your sort of body systems. And, um, and so your muscles get weaker and waste away because you're not using them the way you are today. Even just sitting here, we're using muscles as we sit on the Earth's surface, and all of you are as well. But if you're floating around, you don't use your muscles as much and muscles fade away. And so this challenge was a running challenge. It's called the bleep test. I'm sure many of you are groaning right now because you've done it's it horrific. before in school. Luckily, I'm supremely fit, especially at cross-country running. Really? Yeah, is I'm, that true? Yeah, is that I'm true? So we good. tested this yesterday. That is not true. It's not true. So you, you run up and down this hall in time with these beeps that you can hear, just backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. The trick is that the beeps get closer together in time and you've got to, oh, there's me, you've got to run faster and faster and faster to keep up with these beeps until you miss three beeps and then you're out. Um, so were at you the, the end- Were you the fittest? I, was a sec I came second, I came second. I didn't win. I know I was really gutted about that actually. Um, there's Hannah, she's amazing and I'm running next to her. I'm on the end there. Um, and uh, at the end, if you do the test properly, you are sort of lying on the ground, exhausted, unable to, unable to move. But this is really about testing your ability to the max. Horrific. I can't think of <laughs> <laughs> I have done one of those before. Okay, next one. So that was physical, uh, dealing with failure, physical. Next slide, please, Sam. Practical skills. Ooh. Okay, so as an astronaut, you will need practical skills. Mm -hmm. This is terrifying. Have a look at this. So here, each individual actually in pairs, you're strapped into a capsule and you've got a harness on, a helmet on, and this capsule goes down under the water. And so you're sitting there trapped in, the exits are blocked, the water comes up over your head and the capsule starts flipping over and it sort of goes in circles. Sometimes it flips a bit, sometimes it keeps flipping over. So you're holding your breath, you're upside down, you're strapped into a capsule and your, your single challenge is to wait until that capsule has stopped moving. Hold your breath, wait for the capsule to stop moving, wait for the bubbles to clear, then find an exit, undo your harness and escape from the capsule. This was sold to us as a swimming test. This is not a swimming test. Look at all those bubbles. You can't really see anything. You're a bit disorientated because you've just been flipping around under the water and you just have to not panic. That's, this is about sitting still, being calm, and just waiting for your opportunity to escape from the capsule. Um, and that's what you want in an astronaut, isn't it? You want people that don't panic. You want people that are able just to think calmly in a situation that's new to them. There was a very, uh, and I'm not going to get too deep into this because it's such an amazing story. Amer a British American astronaut, Michael Fole, on the Mir space station, one of the supply ships crashed into the Mir space station and put a hole in it mm. and tss, all the air was leaking out. They had like five minutes before they were all going to die. Now, if it was me up there, I'd be freaking out, I'd be <laughs> crying, I'd be shouting, I'd be getting angry with people. Michael felt very calmly, he's like, okay, we're just going to think it through, got inside the Soyuz that was attached to it and kind of rear, you know, plugged the hole and, did, and just sorted it out. That's what so you want. you've got to be calm. You want people that think clearly under pressure. Exactly. So thinking about. clearly under pressure, that's you. Okay, next slide, Sam. What do we have next for our thing? Leadership. Wow. Mm, so 
what this, does this mean? Well, this is an opportunity that we have three of us left in the competition at this point to dive to the bottom of the ocean in Florida, where there's an undersea on the on the ocean floor, sort of training facility called Aquarius. And we had a chance to go scuba diving down there. And I'd never been down to a place like this before. I barely ever scuba dived. There's fish swimming past the windows, super exciting. And we're exploring around. And suddenly we got a phone call from the land. Chris Hadfield phoned us up and said, the carbon monoxide alarm is going off, which means the air is poisoned. And then he just put the phone down. What are you going to do? Again, Similar I'd be crying. To, to, yeah, yeah, what do you do? Well, first thing you do, grab an oxygen mask. That's going to give you 30 minutes to try and fix the problem. Your other alternative is to try to escape from the capsule, but you're on the bottom of the ocean. You can't just swim to the surface. You get something called the bends, nitrogen bubbles in your blood, it's super dangerous. So you've got to fix the problem where you are. So we all put on these oxygen masks, all three of us, and then looked around. And if you look around in these images, you can see there are hundreds of dials and buttons and it's a really complex system. This is a life support system for an undersea capsule. And we had to figure out which combination of these we needed to press to get fresh air down from the surface and to flush out the contaminated air. So this is a challenge of teamwork. Nobody can complete this challenge on their own. Um, so how well are we working together? But also how, who steps forward and kind of takes command yeah. and who stands back and waits for instructions in essence. Are you a natural leader or are you a follower? No, that's a good question actually. I was really criticized throughout the show for not being a leader, but in this particular example, I did step forward and take command of the situation. So I guess it kind of depends how urgent it is. Uh, I can do both, I can do either. There's another one I'm gonna share, but before we go into the next one, so we'll, we'll hold that. Um, I want to know, are there some good astronaut tests that our people who are tuning in can do at home to test whether they've got the right stuff. Yeah, we're going to we I think we should. Some? I've come up with a couple we've got three different have we got three three different tests which I think you can all have a go at. Really easy to do at home. Now I've devised a test for you because as well as the kind of physical tests no pressure. as well as all the physical tests, fitness, leadership and all those things. Psychology is very important. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know Going into space is obviously very stressful psychologically, and especially if you're up there for a long time. And certainly the early group of astronauts, the very first group of astronauts, the Apollo astronauts, for example, they did what was called a Rorschach test. Do you know what a Rorschach test is? Show me. A Rorschach test. It's basically a, a particular psychologist would show ink blots, like kind of random pictures of ink blots, and ask the, ink, the, the, the candidates what they saw when they looked at this random ink blot. And their response would say something about their inner turmoil. Crikey, right. Crikey, exactly. <laughs> so I've done a couple of ink blots for you. Oh, no. uh, <laughs> this is what I was doing last night. Oh God. I thought, how can I, how can... Okay, Susie, when I show you this, what do you see? Clouds. clouds. Definitely clouds, okay. don't you think? I don't know. That's, some people might see an elephant or whatever. Oh, interesting. Could be animals. No, I think clouds. What, what, about... that, what does that say about my mental state? I know. I'm floating in happiness. I don't know. Also, what does this say about my ink blot ability? Because they all look exactly the same. That doesn't look like a cloud, what though. What does that look like? Maybe a thundercloud. I don't know. Yeah, interesting. Or it could be some kind of a creature. Can you see it looks like, like a dinosaur? Don't I you see. Think? There you go. So I can see your nose. imagination. I, but yeah, maybe a, maybe a dragon. Yeah. So this is what I want you to get at school. So what I want you to do, I want you to do some ink blot tests and so do some ink blots. Basically you make a big squadge of ink and then you fold it over and squadge it and you'll get a kind of weird pattern and do your own Rorschach tests on each other and see what interesting things your friends see <laughs> in the, in the random shapes. But that was a genuine, it's a genuine um, test. It's, people still do it. In fact, my friend, uh, a friend of mine, Beth, who was doing some, work in Concordia in, in Antarctica, they had to do Rorschach tests mm. just to see what was going on in their heads. Like, are they seeing terrible things in those ink blocks <laughs> that they shouldn't be seeing? Who knows? Um, anyway, so that was, that's, that's one. You've got an interesting experiment, an interesting astronaut test people can do. For you to do? Yeah. So one of the tests that we actually did was a, a memory challenge. Uh, and we can actually, we can all do this, in fact. So I'm going to ask Dallas. Sorry. <laughs> I'm easily distracted. <laughs> to go behind the sofa, actually, and and uh, and and step up and down onto a step that's that's back there. This is kind of a multitasking test. It's a multitasking right. okay, and I'm memory do, challenge. Okay. Oh look, there's our rocket. I found our rocket. Oh, there's our rocket. Nice. I might step on the cat. Okay, so we've got. Where is the cat? The cat's vanished. Oh yes. Into space. So, so, a, so I'm going to do. What am I doing? There's here? a step back there. He's going to have to step up and down. You can start stepping. 
okay. up and down onto the step any speed you want to you guys can do this at school if it's a gym bench or something step up and down and i'm gonna ask him to i'm gonna read out some numbers to him you can do this now if you want to along with him uh, and you've got to read them in reverse order. You've got to remember the numbers that I told you and tell them back to me in the opposite order. So if I say five, one, you have to say one, five. Wait, that was my one. I no, we're going to start with three. Oh, no, I can't do three. So your numbers are eight, one, five. Five, one, eight. You're too quick. Maybe you took them a bit more time. Have, you, have a pause before you give me the answer. Sorry, sorry okay. Well, the thing is, if I have a pause, I'll pick up. That's the whole point. So let's try four numbers. You ready for four numbers? No. Give me another three. Just another three. Up. Okay. Um, one, nine, three. Three, nine, one. Yes. Okay. Four numbers. If you get it right, we add yeah, one digit. So, no, we just make it harder. <laughs> so, four, two, Nine, seven. Pause. Go. Seven, nine, two, four. Mm, good. Did I get it right? Yeah. I'm going to space. No, you need to do five. Go. I can't do five. I could try. Okay. Five numbers. Ready, everyone? Three, one, six, nine, four. Four, nine. Blimey. <laughs> <laughs> Do it again. Four, six, one, three is the answer. Four. That's the answer. Four, nine, six, one, three. Yeah, you got it wrong. Come back. That's, really hard. <laughs> that's a fail. So uh, in our challenge, that's what they did. The numbers got longer and longer, and at the end, the people, you know, if you if you make a mistake, that's the end of your challenge. Um, the people that that um, managed to get the furthest got to nine numbers. Before they You're kidding. Mistake. Yeah. It's a really easy. How many did you do? Eight or nine, I think. Just don't even start <laughs> with me. Um, it's a really fun thing for you guys to do at school. You yeah. can practice it. Who, who in your class can do the most numbers? So you've got to do it backwards, stepping, stepping. on a test. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a challenge for you, Dr. Susie Inver. <laughs> uh, one of the other things, we talked a little bit about spacesuits earlier on. And of course, uh, when astronauts wear spacesuits and doing a spacewalk in the Inter mm -hmm. International Space Station, mm -hmm. the reason they're doing that is they've got to go and fix things. They've got to replace batteries, uh, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And those spacesuits are bulky. So I've got here, this is a spacesuit glove, which is a, a really bulky thing. This is a kind of actually just an inner glove. So on top of that, there'd be another glove and this glove would be pressurized. And because it's pressurized, it makes it really hard to bend your fingers. And still, they've got to be able to fix things and do things. Um, so what I've got is a little challenge for you. Okay. I don't have any uh, spacesuit gloves, but I've got a pair of ski gloves here. So I would like you to put those on. Those ski gloves are old friends. Old, old, old ski gloves. And what I've got, this is another thing you can try at school. You can, you can try lots of different gloves. I've got a bowl of screws, uh, little bolts like that. And also some little nuts. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. Dear. And what I want, so what I this is this is about staying calm under pressure. I'm not panicking. I'm just concerned. Okay, <laughs> staying calm under pressure and also manual dexterity. Right. Okay. So what I want you to do is uh, screw as many uh, screws onto the bolts as you can, and I'm going to set a timer. <laughs> Tell me when hold, to start. Hold it. Hold it up so everyone can see. Well, I can't even pick it up. I don't know about hold it up. You've got to do this. What? You can do this. I'm gonna fail my astronaut you've training got, there. Uh, and then you've got. Look how tiny this is. Hang, oh, hang on. How do I do this? Stopwatch. You've got 30 seconds. Go. Oh. Go. Okay. Okay. See if you can see if you can do it. Because this, I mean, we'll, well, I'm going to talk to Kathy Sullivan about this because she actually had to deploy the Hubble Space Telescope, wearing a spacesuit and you know and fixing things. There you go. Oh. oh! Can she oh. get one? Let's see if she can get one. I just dropped it, so that's not a good astronaut thing to do, is that's it? That's the other thing. You don't want to drop things in space because when you're in orbit, you're actually traveling at 17 and a half thousand miles an hour. So if you drop a screw, that is going to be flying at 17, uh, at 17 and a half thousand miles an hour, which means that um, if it hits something, it's going to be... Oh, you've got one on. That's really good. How hard is it? 
tricky, but I'm, I think I'm improving, actually. Good. I think I've got a good technique here, so. Good. Yeah. What you can do if you want to try this at school, have lots of different kinds of gloves. So have perhaps, you know, thin latex gloves you could try, which obviously would be a lot easier. Then try moving up to something like washing up gloves, and then gardening, gardening gloves, gloves yeah. moving on to ski gloves, moving on to ski glove mitts and see how hard it is. And you can test each other. Who does the best? Who can be the most calm under pressure? And totally got look this at down that. now. Oh, hang on, my stopwatch is gone. Oh, I forgot. Hang on. Did you forget to start the timer? Yeah, I did. Because <laughs> I'm an idiot. Oh, yeah, stop! That was eight. That was a minute and a half. Well, I'm still. Nice. So there we go. We've got two on. Congratulations. Thanks. That's your so Space pass. University complete. Space University. Hang on. Let's have a look. We've got some questions. You can do this. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you Yara. Yara. You can do this. I can. Absolutely. Uh, nice. She, she, she can do it. Good. Good challenge. Would it be it? Oh, someone. This is a good question. Jordan from Eastleigh Primary School in Cramington wants to know, would it be possible to jump on the moon? Yes, definitely. So the moon, because it's smaller than the Earth, has a lower gravitational field. So when you jump on the Earth, the gravity pulls you back down again, you land. On the moon, it's smaller, it's less mass. And so it means that if you jump, you jump much higher. So if I jumped here, jump a little distance, if, this, if I was sitting on the moon and I jumped, I'd hit my head on the ceiling because gravity is so much lower on the moon than it is on the Earth. So definitely possible to jump. And there's some great videos, aren't there, of some of the early astronauts on the moon leaping around uh, because they can, which is exactly what I would do if I went to the moon. I'm going to show, can you really do like seven numbers backwards? Yeah. I'm going to test you. Because <laughs> I, I can't believe it. Hang on. Let, totally hang can. On, wait, wait, wait. Don't, don't look. What? <laughs> you don't have to do the step thing. This is, I mean, I don't know how on earth anyone could do this. So the number is, I don't know, if you, have you been doing this at school? I don't know how many, I can basically do three, maybe four. So I'm going to read you this big long number and I want you to give it to me backwards. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Three, nine, four, seven, one, five, six. Six, five, one, seven. Four, nine, three. That's unbelievable. <laughs> Honestly. Yes, <Yeah, it's> few. <laughs> do you not think that's, un I think that's unbelievable. <clears throat> what does that remind you of? A cloud. There you go. <laughs> Susie Ember has the right stuff. Um, okay, so that's some little astronaut experiments that you can do at home. Have a little, have a little uh, try with some of those. Let us know how you get on if you try some of those throughout the day. <laughs> Thank um, you, Flynn. Flynn just gave me a clapping emoji. Good. Let's see what happened. Do we... Uh, who, has anyone dropped a needle in space? Hey, that was a really good question. Yes, is the answer. People drop all kinds of things uh, when they're out there fixing the International Space Station. My favorite things that people have dropped, um, a spatula. Oh, mm -hmm. well, when you say drop, it doesn't drop. It doesn't it drop, but, but sort of floor. let go. So if you're an astronaut. Accidentally let go. Let go of, ah, and you can't get it back. It so it's well, we're going to see that in a minute, actually, on the next clip. But the best thing, this is my top thing that's floating around in space that someone dropped. The Russians, bless them, chucked a Orlan spacesuit out of the space station with a radio in the helmet. So, and, so they, there was a spacesuit floating like a, with a radio and, and they, you could tune into it. Oh. And then it burnt up. Not that sound happens in space. I might, I might have a picture of it. I'll dig it out later. Anyway, so the, it's not there anymore, but there was a, there was a spacesuit floating around. It doesn't sound like it just sounded like they threw it rather than dropped it, but I guess. Yeah, they kind of pushed it, pushed out. it out. And so there was this, I like the idea of this kind of human floating. With a radio. With a kind of beep, like, like Sputnik was a mm. radio thing. Uh, yes, anyway, I'm <laughs> waffling now about weird things. Okay, but uh, this is the best test. We called it our favorite test. Yeah, well, certainly my favorite test. So this test, yeah, we're, we're in a, something called a centrifuge, and this is used for fast jet pilots. So if you're going to go in a fast jet, you might do a maneuver. And as you do that maneuver, you might feel high G-forces. So right now we have one G on our body, the force of gravity, one times gravity. But as you start doing loop the loops or exciting things in your jet plane, you're going to feel um, really squashed, a bit like if you're in a car with mom and dad and they go around a corner too fast. Look at Tim's face there. Look at how his face is kind of sagging downwards. He's feeling this enormous force from his head towards his feet, which is making his face droop. It's making it hard for him to breathe. It's making it hard to speak, to move your hands uh, or your feet. And you can see, oh, there's me. Uh, and, uh, and so this is exactly what it would feel like. If you're going to launch upwards in a rocket, as the rocket goes up, you're going to feel squashed. A bit like going on a fairground ride, in essence. 
And this is just an extreme version of that. And so we were going in this machine and trying to see how our bodies would cope um, with, with this. And so actually one of the challenges is that um, as you get accelerated and you feel squashed, um, your body finds it really hard to pump blood up to your brain because there's a force on your blood and your whole body that's downwards. And if your brain doesn't get enough blood, then you pass out. So how are you going to stop that from happening? You're going to first recognize you have a problem. And that happens because your eyes are really sensitive to the amount of oxygen that they're receiving. And so as your eyesight starts to fail, it's such a strange feeling, but your eyesight starts to turn black and white. You get tunnel vision. You realize you've got a problem. You're about to pass out. Your job is to tighten your stomach muscles and your leg muscles as tightly as you can. Squeeze, 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 stopping the blood from pooling in your feet and forcing it into your brain. And that's how you stay conscious. So that was really what we're trying to do here. Meanwhile, the night before, Chris Hadfield, the astronaut, had given us a copy of the Russian alphabet. So the character in Russian and how you pronounce that character in English. Uh, if you'd learned that Russian alphabet, we were told it was just for fun. It really wasn't just for fun because as we were spinning around, Russian words were appearing on the screen in front of us and we had to read out those words, sound out those words, work out what each letter sounded like and read them all out and we'd end up with a word in Russian. Uh, and so um, this is about multitasking. It's about your body being under enormous pressure because you're spinning around in this machine, but also having to do cognitive challenges. It's my idea of hell. <laughs> Uh, here's a good question for you, very quickly. Yeah. Yara, again, we like Yara. Yeah. If I have a tea party in space, Lovely. because who wouldn't? Absolutely. Uh, what will happen to my teacups and tea? Will my tea inevitably spill on a crew member? Mm. If so, how do I ensure that I'm not liable for my tea and the dry cleaning bill? Yeah, well, it's a, it's a great <laughs> question. I'm going to answer it in the next slide, actually. So let's have a look at the next challenge and we can think about teacups in space. Um, we were on an aircraft uh, and our aircraft had all the seats taken out an ordinary plane without any seats in it. Um, and the plane flies in a weird way. So rather than just going up and heading along to your destination and coming down, this plane flies like this. If you can see my hand, but it flies up and down, up and down, up and down. Those are the mathematicians that flies in a sine wave, basically. Um, and, or a massive um, sort of ride on a fair somewhere. And the idea is that as the plane goes up, it then starts to fall. And as the plane falls, everything inside the plane falls with it. And it feels like you're floating in space. And you get about 30, 25 to 30 seconds, depending on the skill of the pilot, of this situation called microgravity, which is just like it would feel like to be on the ISS. I never quite understand space. why they use the word microgravity. Here's the, so I could say zero gravity if I wanted to, and that would, be, that would give you an instant picture of what I'm talking about. But there is still gravity. I'm still in a gravitational field here. But. So actually, it's just a, it's semantic so that we don't confuse people and make them think that there's no gravity in space because there is gravity in space. But I think microgravity is the wrong word because I think that implies there's because there's just as much gravity on an aeroplane at 30,000 feet as there is on the ground. Not quite. But it's certainly not micro. <laughs> no, you're amount. right. We need, to, we need to coin a new phrase. We need to coin a new word. Think of a better phrase than microgravity, please, by the end of the day. Yara, <laughs> you can do that. For me. I want a better phrase than microgravity. And so we're floating around, 30 seconds, and uh, the BBC, they wanted us to pretend to fly like Superman. Do you remember Superman flies along like this? Uh, and that's what we're trying to do here for their publicity shot. Um, there's three candidates here and one real astronaut. So spot the real astronaut in this picture. Uh, Spotted. The, the guy on the right-hand <laughs> side is doing a really great job. Of, if they've got a moustache as well, it's probably He's an got astronaut. a moustache, a very famous moustache, yeah. and he's flying in a very controlled way. So you start out lying on the floor, and then you lift off the ground. This is amazing. Imagine doing this. You start flipping around. You know, I've never been able to do a backflip in real life. So I was doing backflips all over this thing. Um, here's our Superman shot. As you can see, you know, we're kind of out of control. We hit the camera person. <laughs> we do some damage. Uh, it's really hard to control what your body's doing because you're floating around. If I push somebody, they just sort of keep floating away. So you, you've got to be super cautious and careful. You bump into the walls and the ceiling and each other. And our challenge is to get a camera. These uh, things are in fashion again now, actually, a Polaroid camera. Very fashionable. So you get a film, put it into the camera, fly to Commander Hadfield, take his photograph, which will pop out, because it's a Polaroid camera, and sign your name on that photograph. Each of us had three of these loops each, which is about 80 to 90 seconds to complete the challenge. And if I gave you this challenge right now, all of you would be able to do it in 80 or 90 seconds, sitting on the ground. It's way harder up there. So mm. you can see, 
you know, if I've got objects like the pen and the bag and the film and the battery and I let go of them, they float away. So I've got to hold on to them. See, Tim's got a bag in his mouth there trying to hang on. Got to worry about these things. I pushed off too hard, crashed into Commander Hadfield, bounced off him and took his photograph and just managed to sign my name on it in time. Tim there turned the camera on and off five times and never found the button to take the photograph. So he got almost to the end of the challenge and just failed at the end. Um, but really nice insights into what it's like. It's funny. I always, it's, I think the whole gravity thing, just kind of going back on this idea of microgravity and gravity and the fact that you're floating around on an airplane. Mm. Now, the reason you are floating around on an airplane mm. is the same reason that they're floating around on the International Space Station. They're not floating because there's no gravity. They yeah. are floating because they are falling. At the same rate as the vessel as, they're inside. Correct. Yeah. So our friend Isaac Newton, he did this very interesting thought experiment. I'm going to draw it for you. Okay. On this here piece of paper. <laughs> so there's the Earth. Yeah. The Earth. An obloid spheroid. An obloid spheroid. The Earth isn't flat, by the way. <laughs> uh, he imagined, he did this drawing of a cannon on top of a mountain. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, this is a really rubbish drawing. You can't even, but I'm going to try and explain. And Isaac Newton imagines firing a cannonball, duh, 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 and it hits the ground. Mm -hmm. Like if you throw a ball and it falls onto the ground. Mm -hmm. Now, if you can throw the ball far enough, so you miss, you go beyond the horizon, ba, 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 basically you keep on falling. They can't see that. <laughs> but it's not, there's no gravity. It's no. Just, you're just falling around yeah, you're the fall, earth. You're continually falling in a circle around the earth. So basically. that's why you're weightless. Yeah. And likewise on an airplane, you're not falling around the earth, but you're in a parabola. Just falling so. at the same rate as the plane, so it looks like I'm floating. And actually, in answer to your question, uh, as we were flying around, so the f most fun part was one of the camera crew had a really big um, bag of Skittles in his pocket, you know, his little, the little sweets, and he opened this bag of Skittles, and there were hundreds of Skittles floating in the aircraft, and we were floating around, I like the orange ones, trying to eat the Skittles out of the air as we floated along. Well, you know why he did that? because it's a classic Simpsons reference. Is it? Yeah, when Homer goes into space yeah. and he opens the bag of Skittles and they're all floating. And there's that great scene where Homer, to the 2001 music, dee, 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 you know, Blue Danny, with his mouth open, <laughs> hoovering up all the Skittles. It's a Simpsons episode. You've seen it. She's never seen the Simpsons. Yeah, I'm not a fan. But, 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 then someone got a bottle of water and emptied the bottle of water inside the aircraft and what happens is you get these big blobs of water that float around and kind of hit people in the face as they fly um so that's what would happen to your tea if you were having a tea party so you get lots of blobs of tea that would be floating around um and actually in answer to this question which is something about feeling sick in space um this makes you feel really sick in this plane so um doing somersaults was a really bad idea because that started i'm not even that motion sick normally but it made me feel really sick and and think about what would happen if you were sick in that in that craft given what happens to the skittles and the water it's bad it's uh, bad Don't which is sick. why astronauts when they launch they take dramamine which is a seasickness tablet. Damn, i'm not surprised yeah ready what five <laughs> seven yep one do this at home do this see if you can do this five seven one five seven one one three six eight five five eight Six, three, one, one, seven, five. That's on. I How many was that? Eight. One, eight. <laughs> <laughs> she can just look at it and go eight. I'm like one, two. <laughs> can you do eight? I want to know. If, give me, like, if you can do eight, be honest. Let me see if any. Um, I bet there'll be some, some young people Type out there the who'll be able to do. Who'll be able to do. Well done. <laughs> Dawn says well done. Thanks, and Dawn. I want to say well done to Dawn. Dawn's our producer who's doing this. He's panicking in a room with Claire and Sam going, what are they talking about? <laughs> Numbers and Rorschach tests and, and what have you. Uh, very quick question. What water is going to gel texture in space so we drink water? Ah, uh, so it's oh, not, the water is not turning into a sort of the texture of a gel. Oh, it's all to yeah. do with um, the fact that there's, there's a single tension. surface tension associated with water. So if you pour water, if you have water in a cup, there's some sort of tension on the surface and that makes sort of, if you look Lemiscus. really carefully, yeah, you can see it's kind of a strange shape. It's not exactly flat. The water almost looks kind of like this, strange at the edge. Um, and anyway, this is single surface tension, which kind of holds the blob together, basically. So it's not that it's a gel. It's just it looks like a gel, tension. though. I, like gel. I agree. And actually, in terms of digestion and things, yeah, I mean, it, your body is trying to overcome the fact that you're floating. And normally we have gravity that helps us. You know, if you don't feel very well, sometimes you stand up and go for a walk and help your digestion. It's not going to work in space, so... Um, how, how long is our show last? Hang on, uh, nine forty-five to eleven thirty. Yeah, we're going to crack on. Uh, yeah, right, we've, we've done um, we've done astronaut training. Yeah, 
we, hopefully that's given you a little bit of an idea of what it's like to be an astronaut, the kind of skill sets that you need, uh, and you can try some of those at home. It's not all about just being an astronaut. Like, the other things that I'm really interested in, the history of human spaceflight, is, is things like, like clothes mm. and food and mm. what you take with you and how you sustain life. And so I've d done a little chapter called Packing for Space. And we're going to talk about some of those things right now. Uh, my first slide, what do we have for my first slide? Let's talk about food. We, we, someone was mentioning bacon sandwiches earlier on. Um, if you're going into space for a long time, you have to really think about things like food. We take food for granted. When we're here on Earth, we just go into your fridge at home, or in my case, I go into Susie's fridge <laughs> and help myself. Um, but this, I, this is a wonderful picture. I love this. This is beef with vegetables. This is the food that the Apollo astronauts took with them to the moon. And I call this toothpaste food because mm. it doesn't look very appetizing. No. Basically what it is, it's dehydrated. To, you know, you, they take all like the water. A bit like mountain, is that what they have? Do you have mm. dehydrated, yeah, food? dehydrated food? And why would you have that dehydrated food when you're mountaineering? Because food is heavy, water is heavy. Yes. And so you take dehydrated food high up on mountains and then you melt snow and ice to give you the water, you add it to the food and you end up with something roughly edible at the end. Well, there you go, They're exactly the same reason. So this mm. would, they'd add, the, the astronauts would add water to this and mm. reconstitute it mm. and then eat it. The thing that's interesting about the Apollo astronauts who went to the moon 50 years ago is that a trip to the moon it doesn't last that long. It's three days to the moon, depending on how fast you're going. You might be on the moon for a couple of days, three days, say, and then three days back. So you're kind of done and dusted in a week, 10 days for a lunar trip. But these days, you know, people who go into the International Space Station are up there for six months or a year. And you don't want to be living on beef with vegetables <laughs> <No>. <laughs> like that. And so a whole science has developed about designing food that astronauts can take with them, but not only sus sustain them physiologically, but also psychologically. Because as you know, food has a very important psychological component. If you're feeling depressed or if you're feeling low, first thing you want to do is make something delicious to eat or eat some ice cream. And, and food it, it has an important um, uh, for, for that particular reason. So when Tim Peake went up to the International Space Station, um, he got this chap, Heston Blumenthal. Have you heard of Heston Blumenthal? I have heard of Heston Blumenthal, yes. They thought, okay, we need to someone really clever to design Tim a menu uh, to take up with him. So they got Heston, who does lots of science things with cooking. And Tim's favourite thing he likes to eat are bacon sandwiches. So the t Heston was tasked to make a bacon sandwich. Now, you may think a bacon sandwich is easy to make, but the problem is, for all the things we've discussed already, things like bread in space is a really, really bad idea mm. because bread makes crumbs and normally crumbs just fall to the ground or on your bed sheets. Have you ever had a sandwich in bed? <laughs> no, but it's like, you know, you're eating toast in bed and you get crumbs. You can crumbs. at least hoover up though, it's easy, whereas... Uh... Crumbs, they're going to float around in microgravity and they can get caught in spacecraft equipment and it could be very bad. So uh, th th Heston had to design a bacon sandwich that would be space worthy. And I love this. TV chef Heston Blumenthal. This was a, a, a newspaper headline. Creates bacon sandwich costing a couple of million mm. pounds. A couple of million pounds for a bacon sandwich. I mean, normally a bacon sandwich... How much does a bacon sandwich cost? Like a couple of quid? Four pounds. Four pounds? Nice bacon. I, I insist on nice bacon. Anyone from in Greg's in with us today? Yes. Greg's has a northeastern company. Greg's. Homemade bacon sandwich is better than anything. There is. So I've got a two million pound bacon sandwich here. This is one of Tim's. Is it the world's most expensive bacon sandwich? That is the world's most expensive bacon sandwich in my hand. And if you look very closely at my webcam, you might even be able to see um, Heston Blumenthal's name. There you go. Uh, and interestingly, you talked about Russian. You can see it's both, it says bacon sarni on the label. And it's also in Cyrillic as well, the Russian alphabet, because... There are Russians on the International Space Station. There are Russians on the International Space Station. And all astronauts who go to the International Space Station learn have Russian. to learn Russian. Uh, so there you go. Um, and this is, this is what's called bonus food. So there's some general food on the International Space Station that anyone can eat. And then all the astronauts will have special food, which is just for them. A bit like when you're Ooh, a student. What would you take? Oh, though? you know what when students, take? oh, they're really annoying and they to write their names on, a, on an egg <laughs> to make sure you're in a shared house. So this is something that you can think, what would you take to the is International Space Station as your bonus food? And dairy milk. Dairy milk. I love chocolate. I love chocolates. What would I take? I'd take something lobsters. No. <laughs> that would be the worst. That'd be no, the, yeah, that's... Have a think as well. What would be the worst thing 
to take to, take to <laughs> the international... It might be lobster. It may be. Uh, which part of the... Oh, hang on, someone wants to know about the ISS. Uh, which part of the ISS was built for us? We assume the toilets. <laughs> oh, well, there's so many good toilet yeah, stories. Well, well, we'll, we might come on to toilet stories in, in a bit. But there you go. So this is the, the, a two million pound bacon sandwich, also known as my pension. <laughs> yes, I might stick when it when uh, I might stick this on eBay. But actually, time. you know, w when was the sell by date? Does it last forever? No. Oh God, this is out of date. Uh, 2017. But I feel it. I feel how light it is. Not only did they have. Oh, to... that's really light. I know. Actually, I've well, never... for the I've same never... reason, you want things have to be very yeah. light. So this is a particular. The can itself had to be specifically designed. Uh, it mm. looks like a can of cat food. So yeah, this is actually a plastic material, that? and then this lid here is aluminium. Mm or aluminum for our American viewers. Uh, so very, very lightweight. I wonder if they've got like ketchup in it, like HP sauce. Oh, open it up. Set, no, no I'm not, that's that. my pension. That's my two million pound bacon sandwich. Um, oh yes, so I forgot about this. Luckily, because um, uh, I've come to Susie's house, Susie's made me a bacon sandwich, <laughs> which didn't cost two million pounds. No. But actually you can see, just as I hold it, why this would be a terrible thing to have a, a, in space. This is the crummiest bread. It's just yeah, I'm sorry. No, no, we don't, we don't mean crummy, <laughs> but it, it, it makes crumbs. Yeah, yum. Bacon sandwich, there you go. Pretty good. Mm -hmm. Pretty good. Not bad. It's a bit got, cold. We made it. I've got good skills. We made it earlier. Those are basically my skills, bacon sandwich skills. Um, so there we go. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> Spaghetti bolognese, Ethan. Mm. I think they do that. I think... Um, they still have kind of pouch food where they put water in and, and, mm. and you can squidge it. But you have to be very careful because things like plates, the plate is designed with gravity in mind. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's like a rhyme. Mm. I might have that on my bumper sticker. So obviously plates are going to be no good on the International Space Station. You don't have things like open flames. You mm. don't have things like, you know, hobs. Um, so there you go. Have a little think about that. What would you take to space? What wouldn't you take to space? Um, yes, and cuspids, spaghetti bolognese. I would definitely take that. Ice cream. They always have that kind of astronaut ice cream in in the gift shop, but I don't think it's. No. I don't think it's very good. Um, how do you go to the toilet in space? We're gonna we're gonna come on to some um, toilet related things. I can't remember what we're talking about next. Oh yeah, so let's have a look. After this slide, we've got a picture of um, Tim with his bacon sandwich. There we go. There you go. Uh, with the sandwich. There we go. Uh, actually, this was um, a different, that, that tin is his Operation Raleigh beef stew that he mm. ordered. Um, it's really funny, actually, because these days, astronauts, we're so familiar with watching astronauts working because we've got the internet. But 20 years ago, before the, you know, before the International Space Station was built, and we had the Mir Space Station and the Salyut Space Stations and Skylab and all the other space stations, a lot of what astronauts did was slightly mysterious and no one really kind of knew. So... We're very lucky to have people like Tim and Kathy Sullivan, who we're going to be talking to a little bit later on. Wait a second, Eastleigh Primary School, McDonald's? Is that a no. Scottish restaurant? <laughs> you just I'm... keep talking because I'm quite enjoying this bacon sandwich. So. <laughs> Don't eat all the bacon sandwich. I want some of that couscous. Not a great couscous mm -hmm. would be the worst mm -hmm. idea. Can you imagine mm -hmm. eating couscous? That's just going to go everywhere. Um, but it's really fancy. You know, they have Michelin star chefs now working with all the astronauts. Um, there we go. Okay, so couscous, not a great idea. Lobsters, terrible idea. Mm, lobsters. School mints and dumplings. School mints and dumplings. Is that a good thing or a bad mm. thing? I'm just having a little look at the... Um, um, uh, how do you sleep in space? How do you sleep in space? I sleep very badly on Earth. Uh, maybe in space I'd sleep better. Okay, we're going to move on. Right, what have we got after food? Is that a little bit, bit about food? What's our next, uh, our next slide, Sam? Oh, yeah, I want to talk about spacesuits. Off you go. Because, you know, you can rock a spacesuit, sure. A flight suit. Exactly. But if you're going to go into space, Rocket. you know, space is obviously a vacuum. There's no air to breathe. There's no atmospheric pressure. So the body, the human body, has evolved to live at 1G at the bottom of an ocean of air. So if you're going to leave that, you need to wear something. And this was, um, I mentioned these two astronauts earlier on. This is um, Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin, who are two American test pilots who flew the, uh, cr the Crew Dragon to the International Space Station earlier in the year. And I was looking at their spacesuits they were wearing. This is the latest SpaceX designed spacesuit. And I was wondering what you thought of it. Because behind me, as you can see, that's an Apollo era spacesuit, 1960s, actually designed in the 19, yeah, in the early 1960s, but looks very different to something like this. This looks very, it's very streamlined, isn't it? You know, it looks like something out of the movies. 
Well, this is what I wanted. I was thinking you might say that because it mm. was designed from something out of the movies. It was designed by a movie set designer. Mm. Because Elon Musk, who runs SpaceX, he said, okay, we're going to design these new spacesuits, this new spacecraft. They've got to look badass, mm. was his exact words. Right. And so they got... Was this um, sort of, you know, the, the look over the, over the function? Well, it's, it's, it's a bit of both because historically space suits have always borrowed from science fiction. Mm. So the very early spacesuits, Project Mercury, if you Google Project Mercury, the very, very first ast American astronauts who went into space wore silver spacesuits. And those, the reason they were silver was nothing to do with any mechanical reasons or any physical reason. It was purely they wanted them to look like the Buck Rogers spacesuits because they wanted the public behind them and they wanted the astronauts to be this new breed of heroes. So they gave them cool looking spacesuits. And so, uh, yes, these still function as spacesuits, but they're designed to look very, very streamlined. Very, mm -hmm. They're very, very conscious about what they look like. Um, but they weren't always like that. I've got a, I've got a few more spacesuit slides um, for you to look at. Let me have a look. Yeah, have a look at, this is a little video I want to show you. So this is a video from the late 1950s, 1959, before anyone had been into space. Uh, I think we should now consider one of the most important accessories of such a space flight. That is, 57, space suit. Well, Doctor, that's just what I want to ask you about. This forerunner of the space suit developed for the RAF, which we're now going to see publicly for the first time, just how big a step forward is it? Well, there's a, a very long step between the partial pressure suit, which has been shown before, and this particular suit you see now. Perhaps we can have this inflated and you can see the action. See, space is a vacuum, and the suit has to be pressurized. I think it looks like every boy's idea of a real space tour. <laughs> Can you move around? This is my favorite bit. <laughs> if you take it off, one of the most difficult engineering problems of the, in designing such a shoot, suit is to provide an adequate range of physical movement whilst the man is pressurized. Well, I can see he seemed to move around all right. Were you uncomfortable? You're sweating furiously now, but were you really uncomfortable in it? I was a little hot. Um, I think the reason there is that uh, if you are hot and you don't get sufficient ventilation, then uh, of course you just sweat and get even worse. So there you go. That's Spacesuit 1957. I love that video. Can I say the reason I love this video is that that chap inside the spacesuit is wearing a shirt and tie. <laughs> Rule one, if you're testing a spacesuit, don't wear a shirt and tie. I mean, <laughs> no wonder he was a bit warm, actually. I can see that. So there's lots of problems, lots of things to think about when designing a spacesuit. And these are things that you need to think about as well. It's a good exercise to do at school. How would you design a spacesuit? What does a spacesuit need, need to be able to do? First of all, you need to be able to breathe. It needs to pr provide oxygen. So a spacesuit is actually just a, a clothes. It's, it's, it's like a one person wearable spacecraft mm. and it's got to be pressurized. I've actually got a, this was a magazine going back. That's 1957. This is a magazine I found in a junk shop, uh, which I absolutely love. It's called popular mechanics, 1934. Look at that. 1934. Uh, and inside it is a description of the very, very first spacesuit. And it was designed by a guy called Wiley Post. And Wiley Post was an American aviator and he wanted to fly up in the stratosphere, this is in the 1930s. But he realized the pressure up there was so low, he needed to kind of create almost like wearing a bicycle inner tube that you could inflate and would provide that pressure that we're used to down here that they don't have up, up there. And so all kinds of you know, exotic materials were used and eventually they just made a kind of rubber suit that was inflated and that was it. it was, as you can see there. Mm, so mm. pressure is, is the thing as well. But of course, once, you, once something is under pressure, it becomes stiff and rigid. And if you're an astronaut trying to screw things onto yeah, it, measure, to. it becomes very, very hard to bend. If you imagine like a big balloon, one of those long modeling balloons, yeah. which is all kind of flexible when there's no air in it. As soon as you put air in it, it becomes very, very stiff, which is why if you look at spacesuit joints, they're almost like that. Um, but for the sort of convolutes, you can see a bit like a drinking straw, you know, mm. the bendy bit of a drinking straw. Um, but you don't just go from nothing to a perfect spacesuit like the one behind me. This next slide is, is a, an example of a kind of intermediate stage. This is one of my favorite 
suits when they were designing, thinking about, well, how are we going to go on the moon? What are they going to wear? And of course, they came up with like crazy things <laughs> like this. I mean, that's kind of how engineering works. You don't just go from idea to perfect thing. You mm, have mm, prototypes. Phases and testing. Things that work and things that don't work. Now, looking at that as, a, as an engineer and scientist, what, what, are, the, what are your main Yeah, issues? it's very interesting. Actually, what I'm noticing is the guy seems to have a shirt on as well with a collar. So it seems to be a theme. It was the 60s. Yeah. Men wear shirts and Definitely. Collars. I'm loving his slippers as a, as a starting point. Not sure how, how great that section is in terms no. of uh, keeping his feet going. I love the fact that he seems to have, you know, you know, uh, in Peter Pan, you have Hook and Hook loses his hand. They put, they put a hook in place. Yes. Seems to have some devices on the end of his hands there. Like, spanners. Uh, just as, you know, if you're going to lose, not be able to use your fingers, what do you need? A spanner. I'm going to have spanners on the end of my hands. Spanners. Hand. Oh, Stephen. Hi, Stephen Salmon. Uh, yes, the first suit on the moon was from the British Interplanetary Society, there which you, you can see in the Space Centre in Leicester. Oh, really? Yes, it's there. There you go. Designed by... Ari Smith, I think. Anyway, my favourite bit, if you look at the, um, the little blurb mm. on this slide, it says, um, uh, spacemen could wear the suit while exploring the moon, even rest in it if he's on a long, a long hike. hike. So yeah. look, they've got little kind of three legs. Oh, I didn't notice that. That's super yeah, handy. There's like a little seat in it. Yeah. The best bit is this. It says, uh, hang on. Uh, uh, the suit's Ooh. made of aluminium, circular plastic windows, uh, there's a, oh, here we go. The controls are inside the cylinder, along with shelves of food for long journeys. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, they've sort, of thought, about thought about they've thought about everything. In fact, that spacesuit, the Apollo spacesuit, inside the helmet, just inside the neck collar there, there was a little pouch like this, a little kind of plastic pouch that went down there with a straw that came up. And it was called a Gunga Din, mm. this, this pouch, after the Rudyard Kipling poem, which you'll know about mm -hmm. the Indian water carrier mm -hmm. who saves the soldier. Mm -hmm. And it's called a Gunga Din. And so you could have a little drink. So they, they, thought, they thought about that. Yeah. So with a spacesuit, all kinds of uh, engineering features and design has to come into it. It's worth thinking, like, if you're at school, have a little think. Like, if you were designing a spacesuit, where would your spacesuit be functioning? Are you going to Mars? Are you going to the moon? Are you floating around? What kind of things do you need to, to have on it? Like, for example, on the helmets, they'd have a little bit of Velcro stuck on so you could scratch your nose in case you got an itchy nose. Well, you nose. all know how annoying, you know, got an itchy nose and you can't scratch it. Yes, so. exactly. Practical. Uh, now, what else do I have? I, I, let's have the, the next slide. Um, later on today, I wanted to show you this slide because this is a close-up of the suit behind me, although that suit has a different name tag. The one behind me has Armstrong, mm. the first man to walk on the moon in 1969. But Buzz Aldrin was the lunar module pilot who was with uh, Neil Armstrong on that mission. And this is some photographs I took of the actual suit. This is Buzz Aldrin's actual suit. And I just wanted to show you some close-ups of it so you can just get a sense of the materials involved and, and, and how it all works and the stitching that, that happens. And, and you can see the mission patches and the NASA mission patches, because I think it's a really beautiful, slightly forgotten bit of space engineering. We tend to think of rockets and you know, engines and fuel, but actually stitching, the skill it takes to be able to sew and to be able to sew incredibly accurately to make these suits that would withstand the harshness of being on the moon. Let me zoom in a little bit closer. Next slide, please. Yeah, now you can start to see the kind of the nap of the fabric. Mm. This fabric is called beta cloth and it's made of kind of a glass fiber silica, very, very tough, designed to withstand this. So this is, I've got a little pot here. This is moon dust uh, and it's incredibly abrasive. Real moon dust? Uh, it's, um, no, it's analog moon dust. This was, this was made here on earth, but designed to be mechanically same. the same as yeah. moon dust. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, you know, dust on earth, or rock dust or whatever is, is weathered because we have weathering and on the moon there's no weathering so all these pieces are very very sharp mm. and, and 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 the suits has to be very very tough let's go even closer can we go there, there look at that now you can start look at that beautiful stitch isn't that great mm, i do not have that skill no see this is what i mean whatever you like to do in life there's a job for you and and, <laughs> and, and the women who stitched these suits were so skilled at stitching they used to work for a company called playtex who made bras and girdles and women's structured underwear in the, in the 1960s. And, and they were the women who worked uh, at Playtex were so good at saying that NASA said, right, you're going to come and work for us. And they all started making these spaces. I think I've got a picture of, um, who do I have? Yes, there you go, Hazel Fellows. There you go, stitching. She's from Playtex, uh, or ILC Dover, as, it, as, as, the, as that division 
came stitching spacesuits. Amazing. And you might think, well, that was a job for the 1960s. And actually, the next slide, have a look at this. This was an advert that I saw uh, online. Next slide, please, Sam. There you go. Spacesuit sewer. This is like the other day or a couple of weeks ago. SpaceX. SpaceX, blah, 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 blah. Um, there you go. You can go and work for SpaceX and be a, be a spacesuit sewer. I don't think that's my future, but for some of you, this might be your dream job. So bear I've, in mind it's out there. You know, space is so interesting because it, it needs people, the industry needs people from across the board. So not just the people that are going to be the astronauts, not just the engineers, not just the technical people. We need incredible people like people who can sew spacesuits. Yeah, I have. Like As a spacesuit sewer at SpaceX, you'll contribute to history. Absolutely. By creating spacesuits for our future missions. You will create spacesuits and crew equipment that are designed with three main goals. Comfortable, functional, innovative, innovative I can never say that word. <laughs> I'm badass. They missed, that out. they missed that out as well. But there you go. I'm I'm a big fan of spacesuits. I love thinking about spacesuits. It's a great um, uh, example of things that um, you might like to do in life. Go and be a be, be a spacesuit designer. Um, right. We've got how long we have got left? We've got half an hour left. I want to talk. Move on from. We've talked a lot about human space flight. Mm. I want to talk a little bit about your other world, which is as a space scientist mm, yes. uh, and physicist. So tell mm. us a little bit more about what you do. So uh, as a space scientist, I work at the University of Leicester and I work on trying to understand the planets in our solar system. So um, space science is about looking at places in, within reach, basically. That's how I like to think of it. So astronomy is about looking out there at the stars and the galaxies and the clusters of galaxies and the larger scale things that are a really long way away using amazing telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope mm -hmm. we saw earlier to look beyond where we can go. But space science, what I do is about trying to ask questions around how planets and other bodies in the solar system form and evolve over time and being able to hopefully send missions to those places to answer the questions and that's what i love about space science is that is that we can find the answers by sending something out to these places yeah so, absolutely. Um, absolutely what i work on is something called space weather so it's a bit like um a bit like weather forecasting on the earth so you know the met office telling us if it's going to be sunny or not. It happens to be sunny in the Peak District today. Um, we do that in space. We're looking at the sun and we're trying to work out what the weather will be like on the different planets caused by the sun. So bits of the sun erupting and smashing into the planets and having an impact on the environment there. I'm an idiot. Um, uh, Dawn, uh, we don't have half, we've got 15 minutes. What? Because I'm an idiot. I didn't look at my, see, that's why I'd be a bad astronaut. So we're going to crack on. Keep going. Tell us about your project you're working, because I think this is amazing. Next slide, please. Sam, there we go. This is Bepi Colombo. Crazy yeah. name. What's Bepi Colombo all Crazy about? Crazy name, because it's named after the guy that figured out, Giuseppe Colombo, that figured out how to get to Mercury. And uh, it's not an easy journey. I'll show you that in a moment. But this is a mission that's joint between the European Space Agency and the Japanese Space Agency. And it's two spacecraft and they're on their way to Mercury right now. Why? Because we want to understand Mercury, the closest planet to the sun, how it formed, how it evolved, why it looks the way it does, how it interacts with the sun. Um, and this is important because we're looking at planets, we're finding planets around other stars elsewhere in the universe called exoplanets. Many of these planets orbiting other stars are really close to their parent star, a bit like Mercury. So we'd like to understand how planets close to their stars, what the environment is like. Um, the instrument you can see there on the slide on the right hand side is built at my university. We built this instrument. Uh, it's called MIX is its name and it's going to tell us what the surface of Mercury is made of for the first time. When I think of Mercury, I think of it being terribly close to the sun. Mm. How on earth do you send a spacecraft without it plowing into the sun? It is a massive challenge. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, let's have a little think. Uh, so this oh, is the launch, go. yeah. So I went to see the launch. It launched from French Alka -Salsa, Guyana. Big Alka -Salsa a big Alka Salsa rocket, no. <laughs> uh, and uh, I wasn't that close. I didn't take that photograph, but uh, I was a few kilometers away watching the launch, a night launch uh, from French Guyana, which is where the European spaceport is in a place called Karoo. So this thing launched in 2018 in October. Next slide. Please. And this is what's going to happen now. So, so you this can is see, a video. If so if you play, press play, we can have a little look. The so cross is Bepi Colombo. So it's just launched there and the, you yeah. can see the earth going round. And you can see time in the top right hand side there. So it goes outside the earth and then it comes back and it uses the earth's gravity to... It's not obvious because you kind of think straight lines. Not, no, straight lines are a bad idea here because if you go in a straight line from the earth to Mercury, you don't stop and you hit the sun. There we go. So we're going to do 19 laps of the solar system here. We flew past the earth in, in April. We're actually going to now head towards Venus and fly past Venus. 
in two weeks, actually it's the 15th of October. So in a, a week from now, we're going to fly past Venus. Can we find the aliens? We're going to look, but we probably won't be able to detect the phosphine, but we're going to try. But your brilliant spacecraft is going to try. We'll try. It's, so exciting, it's going to be this. such a tough measurement to make, you but we'll try. Do it. Don't let me down. We fly past <sighs> Venus twice. The second flyby, we have a better chance of maybe seeing phosphine in the, in the clouds of Venus. But anyway, after Venus flybys, each time we fly past, we change our trajectory. So we're heading a bit closer to Mercury. Then we fly past Mercury a ton of times. Each time we fly past, we're just getting our spacecraft in the same orbit as the planet. That's our goal. So at the very end of this seven-year cruise phase, our spacecraft and Mercury basically going at the same speed in the same direction, and we can get captured by Mercury's really weak gravitational field. Because Mercury's really small, there's not much gravity wow. there. I think orbital mechanics are interesting. It's hard. It's, yeah, hard. it's go, hard. Listen, if you're at school, go to be an orbital specialist. And you'll, you'll, have a, you'll have a job for life. <laughs> be a space scientist. Great. Okay, next slide. Yeah. Please. So it, it arrives at Mercury in December 2025. I made a Lego model uh, on the right hand side there at the bottom. That is the European spacecraft, and the blue brick is our instrument, um, which is so you can see in the top right hand picture. On the yeah. left, you can see the scale of it. That's in the Science Museum. They've got the actual structural thermal model, so an exact uh, a, a test model of the spacecraft, that's me and my, my colleague standing in front of it. So you can see the scale, this thing is seven meters high. There's two spacecraft inside of this and a carrier module. And when they arrive at Mercury, they split apart and these two spacecraft orbit the planet separately. Um, Next slide. How many Please. students are participating in this meeting? That. I don't know what that means. <laughs> so our instrument, how does it work? We fly over the surface of Mercury, press play please Sam. And there are these x-rays coming off the sun. You know, like if you break a bone and you get an x-ray and it looks at your bones. Well, there are x-rays coming off the sun all the time and they hit the surface of the planet and they cause the surface of the planet to give off x-rays in turn. And we're just a big x-ray collector. We collect up all those x-rays. The energy of the x-ray tells us the atom that gave off the x-ray. And we just build up this picture of atoms by measuring all these x-rays, a little bit picture of atoms on Mercury's surface. And that's how we figure out what the surface of Mercury is actually made of with our instrument. Brilliant. So it's an x-ray spectrometer. Really com it's complicated. Yeah, next slide, please. Oh, that's Voyager. Oh, oh we're gonna go well, maybe that's just, the end gonna, of the Columbo. I'm gonna pause on that. Um, we've got Yara who's been- Yeah, Yara, lovely. Great. She's got some better terms than microgravity. Mm. Breezy gravity. Breezy gravity. I like feathery, feathery gravity. gravity. Yeah, I've got a feather here. I'm going to come to my feather in a minute. Maybe. Diet gravity. <laughs> I like that, like Diet Coke. Yeah, light. Half gravity fat. light. Yeah, half the fats of normal gravity. So you need to keep your eyes open. December 2025, we arrive at Mercury and we start taking measurements. How? I mean, my, the obvious question is, it's caught on Mercury because it's very close to the sun. How do you not just burn up? Yeah, so our, our spacecraft, the day side of Mercury, the side facing the sun, bear in mind a day on Mercury is 59 Earth days, so it rotates really slowly. The day side is about 450 degrees Celsius. The night side is about minus 180. Mm -hmm. So the swing from day to night is around 600 degrees, 700 degrees. And our spacecraft goes from one to the other in a few tens of minutes. Our instrument would like to be operating at room temperature, please. How on earth do you get it's it at really room hard. That's the massive challenge. We've got radiators. This is why we need got... good people working in yeah, space science. Like it's a you. massive challenge. Uh, my favorite space probe or my okay. f ever is Voyager. Now, Voyager, the two Voyager spacecraft were launched in 1977. Now, you're going to Mercury. Mm. Voyager completely left the solar system. Yeah. They visited the outer planets. So they visited Saturn and Jupiter and uh, Uranus and Neptune and then vanished to the outer planets. And this is uh, what it looks like. It's this great kind of like satellite dish with spidery arms coming off it. And it's a wonderful story, partly because if you go to the next slide, Sam, I mentioned the Hubble Space Telescope as my favorite uh, astro photograph, but actually it might be this. It doesn't look like an interesting photograph whatsoever, but if you look at the top of the screen, there is a sort of faint band of light going diagonally across the top of the screen. And if you look very closely, you can see just a dot, a kind of very faint dot. Can you see it there? Mm. That dot was, as the spacecraft left the solar system, Carl Sagan and, and others said, oh, why don't we turn it around and take a picture of, the, of the, ourselves, like a selfie? And NASA were like, yeah, that's not gonna work, it's rubbish. There's no scientific merit. And what science are we gonna do from doing that? And they were like, just do it, stop being a grump and just do it. Anyway, they did it and they took that picture and that dot, is the picture of the earth uh, and i remember when that picture was released 1991 and it had such profound impact because it was the furthest we've ever seen ourselves and it again it put the earth in this context this pale blue dot in this great black ocean of space how 
you know, carefully we have to look after our planet because we're so fragile and so small. And I think actually more than any photograph, perhaps that one, mm -hmm. that one in the Hubble Deep Field, I think, I think is amazing. I was very lucky uh, a few years ago, I did a, I made a little film about Voyager and about the, the implications of Voyager, the implications about leaving the solar system because that spacecraft's going to be going forever and ever yeah. and ever. Well, not forever, but in space, it won't rust. No. It's not going to bump into anything. Its next planetary encounter will be in 25,000 years or, you know, <laughs> millions of years. You know, you know the, the pyramids will have gone and Voyager will keep going. Human beings will have gone and Voyager will keep going. And on board Voyager, there is a, they actually put a, a kind of time capsule. They put a golden record uh, with images and music and, and, and words from planet Earth. I've got a little, a little slide. So there we go. Those are the, the records that were, that were attached to the Voyager, Voyager spacecraft. In case aliens bumped into it or found it, they'd be able to know a little bit about us. And this is, I love this little quotation, Jimmy Carter, who was the president in 1977 in America. Uh, this is a president from a small and distant world, a token of our sounds, our science, our images, our music, our thoughts, and our feelings. We are attempting to survive our time so we, we may live into yours. Mm. <gasps> I love that because it's that quest of immortality in mm. a way. We want all that human beings have done, we want to kind of preserve because the earth isn't going to be around forever and we're not going to be around forever. But Voyager, that record, 1977 technology, go to goldenrecord.org. Imagine this, I'd like you guys at school, it's an interesting project. If you were sending a spacecraft out to a, an alien planet, perhaps on a very long journey that might last millions and millions of years, what about, what of your life would you like to put on there? For example, like maybe your, your school, you could do it as a school project. What, what favorite songs would you like to put out there? And remember when that record was sent, that was a moment frozen in time. That was a decision that was made by a group of people in 1977 using 1977 technology with everything we knew in 1977. And of course, all that stuff on the record is long out of date. There's all kinds of stuff we've, we've, we've learned since then. But it's a really, really interesting exercise, I think, as well as the science to think about, think about things like that. How would you represent humanity on such a voyage? Mm, I think it's really, pictures, yeah. movies. Music. Yeah, there's all kinds of there's all kinds of things. I think that might be all. Oh, actually, I'm going to end um, the last couple of minutes. Uh, we're going to be joined by Connie Huck next uh, in three minutes time. Connie, long term blue piece presenter. I'm glad to see you've yeah, got your I blue, have a blue, piece blue piece badge, badge on. <laughs> Very good. Connie's really interested in experiments, and that's obviously your field as well. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to end with my favorite experiment. We talked a little bit about Newton. Uh, earlier on and one of my favorite scientists of all time was a gentleman called Galileo okay now Galileo 1600s Galileo was really interested in this idea of gravity he talked about gravity and I've got a question for you <clears throat> in my left hand I have a hammer and in my right hand I have a feather appropriately enough it's a, a falcon feather um, and I'm just going to if I drop them at the same time which one falls first? Mm, let's Sci try it. Scientists. <laughs> Which one do you think is going to drop first? Clearly, the hammer drops first. That's the kind of that's the kind of obvious that's the obvious thing. But this was a really really famous experiment. Now, the, there is a reason why the hammer drops first, and you kind of automatically think it's because the hammer it's heavier and therefore it's dropped first. But it's not that at all. It's purely the shape of these two objects, and the fact that we are at the bottom of an ocean of air. And it's only the air that stops the, the feather falling later, which sounds really difficult. It sounds very counterintuitive. Now, if we were gonna do this experiment somewhere else and get a different outcome, where might we go? Uh, well, they did this in 1971. Was it 72? 71, Apollo 15. They redid this very, very ex famous experiment that Galileo did and got a very, very different result. And they actually did it on the moon. And I've got a little uh, experiment to show you. And this will be the last thing. But have a little look at this. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, 
so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here, and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? <laughs> Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. Okay, that is a really interesting thing. And the, what that says to me, the, the importance of experiment, because common sense tells you the hammer is going to fall because it's heavier. But common sense is a really bad tool for <laughs> understanding the world around you. And science is a really, really good tool. So um, do science. That's my advice. Uh, we love science. Uh, science is the way that we explore the world around us. And it's fantastic. And it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for letting me set all this up in your, <laughs> in your city room and do all this. But it's been great for sharing all your amazing work and your incredible experiences. And, you know, and the fact that you can remember eight numbers backwards in, in, in a row <laughs> is absolutely beyond me. But thank you very much indeed. Round of applause for Dr. Susie Imbra. I need a button that plays like a big kind of round of applause.